Hi, uh, my name is Alexander Penenso, but uh, in the company I, I'm known as Sasha because we have too many Alexanders <laughs> in the company. So in order not to be confused. Yeah, and as uh, Erin mentioned, I, I work for four years and almost four years in, in personalization team uh, because once uh, our CEO, Miki Kusi said that Vault is a customer, customer obsessed company and I took his word literally. <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, here, a couple of words about why personalization? Why is it so important, especially for, for us? Uh, well, basically, uh, Bolt is a pretty huge company and we are growing and we are recruiting more and more restaurants. And it leads to a situation where, uh, like when in hundreds of cities, there are locations uh, in which like hundreds of venues are delivering to, to a single location. But the user, the customer, immediately when opens the app, immediately see only a few of them. And our goal is to uh, basically promote the most relevant and we are figuring out how to do that, to like make the customer experience as smooth as possible. So it reduce uh, amount of scrolling and thus uh, increase the customer satisfaction and of course the uh, conversion. Um, so, yeah, and it's pretty tough to do, yeah. Um, yeah, so, and, and how we are doing this, how we are achieving this. Uh, so basically, uh, here is an example of how the real world application looks like. This is one of our tabs. Uh, this is restaurant tabs, and this is a vertical list, but now it's a bit different story, so we have carousels on top, but yeah, it used to be a vertical list and it, it turned out to be a perfect playground for our models because when you have a vertical list, uh, you can uh, basically measure uh, the relevancy of the content that you show. And by uh, relevancy, we mean whether customer well, actually purchased from, from some restaurant in this list. And the position of this list uh, basically uh, matters a lot. So here you can see the graph and uh, you can see like rough idea, uh, like how the conversion uh, changes uh, like from slot to slot. So of course the, if you position the most relevant venue in the first slot, the conversion is gonna be like quite like very high. But if you put it down in the list, so people, are not very uh, very likely to scroll that 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 far. And let's talk a bit about metrics, uh, offline metrics, because uh, our of course our main goal is to verify everything via online experiments, namely A/B tests. And uh, well, we measure of course like conversion, retention, like different business KPIs, but of course. Uh, it's not possible to conduct an A-B test every time you got a, like a idea or a feature, whatever. And that's why you need like good set of offline metrics that, that can predict very well uh, the outcome of uh, an online experiment. And we, uh, by no means, this is the perfect list of metrics, but we found that it pretty much is like co very well correlates with the online A-B test outcomes. And the first, we divided into three groups of metrics, metrics of ranking quality, metrics of uh, content diversity and content novelty. And the ranking quality is probably uh, the most uh, known uh, like set of metrics. Uh, it's, it's, it's coming from information retrieval from search and from other applications. And you can use here, um, NDCG, like average rank, but we found that mean reciprocal rank is quite handy uh, metrics. It's like uh, an average of reciprocal ranks, like one over rank. And it's, it's a good, good thing uh, because it's bounded by zero and one. So the perfect, perfect uh, ranking has uh, a mean reciprocal rank of one, uh, like the worst possible is close to zero. And it's also, I have it has a nice mathematical property because it's like an inverse of a harmonic mean of ranks and harmonic mean by famous theorem is uh, less or equal than arithmetic mean 
and it means that it's it's a less sensitive to outliers. Uh, so and also we uh, we measure heat ratio at different position. It means like in uh, in like in how many like percentages of how many sessions have relevant restaurant placed at position K or higher. So this is also very a useful metric. And then a couple couple things about other metrics like diversity. We would like to also make our content as diverse as possible. So you can imagine like a low low diversity ranking. It's by, by just showing the popular stuff on average to all the customers. And obviously this, this content is uh, less, oh, <laughs> now it's much better. <laughs> okay, and obviously uh, we would like to avoid the situation and make uh, our recommendation as, as personalized and as diverse as possible. And of course, novelty. If you recommend only uh, things that customer has purchased like before, it might might be a good thing. But then uh, it, there is no exploration, no novelty, and customers get bored. Not not good as well. All right. So metric topic is like a vast vast thing. So we can uh, dedicate a whole meetup to this. Uh, but actually, so uh, let's go to machine learning. Let's dive a bit deeper. How we do that actually um, and one of the uh, like there are multiple approaches to solve the recommendation problem or ranking problem so there's are two related a bit different but related things uh, and there are two two main uh, ways of solving this first is by content based recommendation so we when you have features of uh, different products you have features of users and you try to match match those features together. Another thing is called collaborative filtering. And collaborative filtering is uh, basically you find similar customers uh, purchased from uh, similar items, map them together and try to recommend uh, different things to, to similar cost, like uh, things that similar customer bought, but this particular customer didn't buy. And this is achieved in like in usually via so-called matrix factorization. This is a working horse of recommend recommender systems. It works um, as follow as following. So you have a huge matrix here, like it users to items, which is basically which is uh, pretty sparse. It contains ratings. But also it has it contains gaps because uh, customers usually don't interact with all with all items in your item space. Uh, and then you define uh, a dimensionality uh, k, like let's name it k. It's a latent dimensionality, and you have um, a vector co corresponding vectors to customers and items of the same dimensionality k. And you you train your like you optimize this vector vectors in such a way that the dot product of these vectors predicts uh, like actual ratings that you have. And then you by multiplying these two matrices, you have a, a dense matrix of the same dimension as your users' items matrix, but with these gaps filled. And uh, in, the, in the best situation, you fill those gaps, those question marks with meaningful estimates of, of ratings. This is how it, it works in ideal situation. But in an in ideal world, you have all the ratings, all the clean and shiny data. But in real world, it is not the case because, well, People usually do not uh, leave a lot of feedback, right? So, and this is a problem of a feedback sparsity. Uh, and so, so do do we uh, like at Walt? We, of course, we have lot, lots of ratings, but by no means this uh, ratings cover all customers and all the products. Um, and that's why uh, mathematicians come up with clever ways of. Uh, utilizing so-called implicit feedback. 
and by implicit feedback, uh, we mean well, purchases, clicks, adding to favorites, and like whatever. Uh, like for instance, in video, uh, like in YouTube, maybe like uh, length of watching, right? The time of watching could be a, an indicator of uh, of relevance. All right, but then, uh, so how does it work? Uh, basically, so the, the objective stays the same. So we still try to um, try to predict this PUI uh, stands for uh, stands for relevance le relevance because so either either zero or one whether the item is relevant or not. Then we have this uh, product of dot product of uh, user and item vector. And we have a very important thing here, uh, weight C underscore U Y, uh, U I. And it means the confidence score, how, how confident we are that this particular data point is relevant for the customer. And this uh, is a very important uh, step forward, uh, which, which significantly improved the, uh, the recommender systems in case of implicit feedback. Um, okay. And yeah, so forgot to mention. So this, this, uh, this uh, dot product uh, very, very uh, resembles very much the linear regression, right? But it's in fact, it's not. So it's a non-convex optimization problem. And uh, there is a clever algorithm that, uh, that converts this non-convex uh, uh, optimization problem to to a simple linear regression, and it is called it is called alternating least squares. Where, where it works as follow, as follows: you fix uh, one vector, treat it as a features, and you optimize uh, another vector. Like for instance, you fix user user vectors, you optimize item item vectors, uh, and then you fix item vectors, optimize for user, for, for user vectors, and you iteratively until convergence, you uh, find better solutions. As this algorithm is called ALS, and it was our first attempt to make personalized ranking. Um, but then, so we started, uh, we started seeking for ways of improving uh, our current model and stumbled upon uh, like deep neural networks, so-called neural collaborative filtering. We started several baselines, uh, se several, uh, we started several benchmarks and found, found out that NCF like significantly outperforms our current baseline, ALS, uh, on, on, a, on a set of, uh, set of uh, artificial data sets. And of course, we know that 21st century is arguably the century of deep learning. It shines everywhere. Why not it shine in, in, rec in data recommendations, right? In, in recommenders. All right, that, that's great. So we decided to try it, to try it out. We, we started implementing, and uh, here is the explanation why this uh, neural collaborative filtering might actually uh, be a great choice because um, here is an, an example. So when traditional matrix factorization fails, so because uh, there are like one specific example where uh, you cannot uh, like preserve the ranking of all four uh, all four items or four users um, because. Uh, because it, it's, it, it cannot be done just, just like geometric. And neural network, uh, a neural network can solve this problem because it, it can allow like complex nonlinear relationships. Like, but this is great in theory. Uh, so how, how, how like the overall architecture, how does, how does it look like? Um, so this is the most generic architecture from the from the paper, and it basically combines two things. Uh, it combines uh, 
so-called like multi-layer perceptron on the right with so-called uh, generic matrix factorization layer uh, and then concatenation and uh, computing the final score via um, a sigmoid neuron. Uh, so this is pretty, uh, pre looks pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, but, but what about like the actual results? And um, we were a bit frustrated when, when we stumbled upon a, another like set of papers, which claimed actually that uh, neural collaborative filtering when is underperforming simple matrix factorization when the latter is properly implemented. <laughs> well, of course, <laughs> when something is properly implemented, yeah. Uh, but this is like this is a problem, right? So the, the, it's it, the paper claimed that many many uh, like achievements uh, in the recommender systems might be actually uh, well not true. It's it might not be true. So many many achievements may not be as good as as it, as are as they are claimed to be. And the the reason why um, why neural collaborative filtering was underperforming in that uh, battery of tests was that um, it is very difficult, surprisingly, for deep, even deep neural network to uh, approximate uh, such a simple thing as cosine similarity. Cosine similarity metric was pretty difficult task for, for uh, deep, deep neural network. And here we see that uh, we need really, really, a lot of neurons in, in three hidden layers to have a, uh, an error of 0 0.01, which was considered to be like a significant error. All right, so, but, but in, in, reality, uh, in reality, things weren't uh, as bad as this paper claimed because we implemented, tested on the data and the, uh, the new NCF was still a bit better than the matrix factorization, but the difference was only marginal. But then uh, we realized that we are, the paper was in 2017, like, which is a, like a century ago <laughs> when we talk about like machine, modern machine learning. And of course we can do some improvements and uh, like extract some more uh, from, from, the, from this architecture. And the um, and we first started uh, from the loss function because the uh, you can basically divide all the machine learning in three parts like uh, data preparation model architecture and loss function and that's like tra maybe you can also in in, in case of uh, deep neural networks you also can say about something like uh, optimizers uh, choosing proper optimizers. All right, but then uh, what about, what, what's wrong with, with the objective function? So the original paper used binary classification uh, log loss. So, and this is not very good because the, the deep neural networks are very, very expressive models. They can capture very complex relationships. And uh, the, the way how they learn it was basically uh, because we have only positive samples mainly, and other samples are either negative or unseen, and we label them all uh, as zero, as negative samples. And if the model is expressive enough, it will learn almost perfectly the ones and zeros, and thus it will not be able to make uh, good rankings because all the all the unseen and negative values just have a score of zero. This is, of course, uh, a problem uh, only in the extreme because you always can uh, can do some regularization, more aggressive regularization, and avoid uh, like perfect learning of this matrix. But then we can, of course, make the life of our model easier by choosing the appropriate technique by the appropriate uh, like learning objective. And there is a uh, like proper learning objective for, for ranking. This is a whole area called learning to rank. And for that purpose, 
we uh, we looked into the so-called Bayesian personalized ranking. This is a pairwise method of learning a ranking model. Oh wow! <laughs> oh my God! Is it even my slide? Um, all right, but nothing scary here. This is just just an uh, formulation of the Bayesian personalized ranking. So uh, Juan mentioned Bayesian a lot of times. So here's my turn. And like, uh, so what are we trying to maximize is that probability that a positive, positive item will have a higher score than randomly selected negative items. And this is uh, encoded I don't have. Oh, I don't. I don't have a uh, laser pointer, unfortunately. But the the upper formula, this uh, p brackets greater sign u given theta. This means exactly that probability that a randomly selected positive number uh, is a positive item has higher rank than negative. If we if we decompose this, uh, we see that it's like just a product. Of, uh, of a sigmoid function with a, like uh, of some difference, and the difference is f uh, minus f. F is our neural network. So this is some function we uh, input in this function: user ID, item ID, uh, and in you know in the first case it's like positive item ID, and we subtract the score for negative sample and then we put it all together in a sigmoid function and when we take log we usually take log for sake of uh, like easier optimization because it's very difficult to optimize products and easy to optimize some sums um, so our loss function becomes this log sigmoid so uh, and maximizing the difference uh, basically uh, means that that we are seeking uh, the weights that that uh, basically yield the better be best possible uh, like ranking. And here is one uh, one addition that that we introduced to this loss function is this weight w u y, and this is the the weight. From the uh, from the previous slide here, from this paper, it's our confidence weight. So, uh, how confident are we that this particular positive sample is actual uh, is actually relevant for the customer? And the the example uh, of this weight, for instance, if customer made like ten purchases from a selected restaurant. Then we are, then our confidence that it is a really relevant item is higher than if customer clicked only once, right? So if customer clicked only once, it may not like it doesn't matter. So we are not really confident, and thus we can afford ourselves to have a higher ranking error in this particular pair. But if if customer make like 100 purchases from from a restaurant, we cannot afford. To rank it lower than a randomly selected restaurant. So, and this yielded like 20% relative improvement over the, the baseline implementation from the paper. And another thing is very simple also, it's called dropout. And dropout is like a method of regularizing neural networks. And you, when you basically switch off some neurons during the training, and it, it's uh, it basically, um, it is a way of training an ensemble of neural networks within a single neural network. It is fascinating. <laughs> and it yields also a very nice improvement. And it, it allowed to increase training time. Uh, well, sounds not very good, but, uh, but it, 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 it increased uh, our possibility to train model longer without overspeeding achieving like better uh, better uh, training uh, test error. All right, so these were our improvements, but 
the results on offline results may, may be uh, like whatever good, right? So offline results might be very nice, but eventually every model should be deployed to production and uh, do basically do good for customers and, and the company, right? And uh, it, it should bring value. And um, the, the main concern, like many people uh, are concerned about deep learning because they think that deep neural, uh, deep, deep learning, deep neural networks are slow. And in fact, if you, if you see how many parameters our latest neural network has, it's like tens of millions parameters of parameters. And intuitively, it sounds like a lot. So tens of millions of computations. Well, you need like GPUs for serving that or something like that. But in fact, it's not true. So because the architecture of this neural network uh, allows us to do only a handful of computations during the inference because um, majority of the weights are concentrated in these huge lookup tables where user and, and restaurant embeddings are stored. And at the inference, you pick up only, se uh, only uh, several embeddings, not all the embedding matrices, and propagate them, these embeddings, to multi-layer processor layer and GMF layer. So the total amount of computations is pretty affordable. And um, like fun fact, uh, if you have a gradient boost, boosting tree model or a random forest model of the same size of the same like computations as neural network, neural network on a real CPU or is faster than, than the tree model. Why? Because neural network doesn't have uh, any if else statement like any branching and branching because branching is, um, basically is, is very unfriendly to a CPU cache. And due to cache misses, like tree models perform not, not the best. Um, yeah, but okay, so the model works on CPU and the, in majority of the cases, latency is very good. It's like P90, P95 is like 20 milliseconds. But we've encountered during the load testing, we've encountered spikes, spikes in latency. And this is a pro like real problem. So you can't deploy a model that like 95% of the time is uh, this very, very fast, but once in a while, uh, it, it is slow as hell. Uh, so what, what's, what's the problem? Like how to, how to fix, how to isolate? After several hours of brainstorming, we, we found a solution. Blame garbage collectors, always. Yeah, and our solution, like disable garbage collection. It may, so it may sound like crazy, funny, but in fact, uh, there is there is a lot of sense in it, and many companies are doing this when uh, using like Python for. Well, doesn't sound right again, like <laughs> using Python for a high performance application, but but still, uh, like Instagram done that, um, like and now we are doing this, so disabling garbage collection, but then you need to uh, you need to take take into account that. Uh, disabling garbage collection and restarting services. If you have uh, several pods in your Kubernetes cluster, you shouldn't restart them all at once <laughs> because you will get a service downtime. downtime. So, and that's, that's if you do it in the correct way, add them random, add in random jittering. So everything be, will be just fine. So some pods will restart uh, and but while others could still handle the load. And eventually we got uh, like in the load test more than 300 RPS with, late, with a P99 uh, latency of 25, 27 milliseconds and deployed this uh, huge neural network into the load, uh, into the AB test, got successful results and now developing a more advanced version of it covering the whole country.
Yes, so thank you for bearing with me. And it's time for a question. Thank you very much, Sasha. So any questions? Uh, yeah, hi, Maria here from Elsa. Uh, I think I have a couple. Uh, so I might have missed maybe, uh, uh, you might have said and I might have not picked up. So the first one is, did this architecture, was it published or did you uh, cook it up? Yes, the the architecture is published. So okay, it's, uh, but you very, build it from scratch. Yeah, this is like, the paper was, uh, it's like neuro, neuro collaborative filter and you can uh, okay. search it over the web yeah but we we've significantly improved it in-house because well the raw architecture wasn't wasn't that good in real in real life uh, can i also ask um, i didn't understand how the labeling uh happened yeah. uh, that's one question and then also if it's not a p um how do you say uh pi uh is it, what's the word like yeah, if it's not proprietary, proprietary information, uh, whether you can answer what kind of libraries you used, if, for example, the layers are already existing, or did you like write everything from scratch? Yeah, thanks for questions. So regarding la labeling, it's a very uh, nice thing about all, all, all this, that you actually don't need any labeling, because you have an implicit feedback data uh, that customers leave by making purchases, adding adding things to favorites, clicking on something. You need only to properly design uh, like this confidence weight, weights, right? So how confident you are that clicking on a restaurant is, is an example of positive feedback. And this comes like with hyperparameter tuning. You do a lot of experimentation, figuring out like how, what, what brings you the most. Yeah, it's um, no manual work of uh, people that label the data, but a lot of work on fine tuning the, the, the confidence weights and, and procedures. Uh, and the second question, so uh, me, we used uh, pretty generic deep learning frameworks like PyTorch and uh, Spark for data, data wrangling, preparing the training data. Uh, as Arthur mentioned, we use Selden for, for serving the neural network. Um, yeah, but like the whole training pipeline data, uh, like preparing training data was, uh, was written by us in house, like completely from scratch and the, the architecture of the neural network was also a bit altered by us. Thank you. We can take another question. Thanks for the fascinating talk. Um, I'm Jesse McCroskey uh, with ThoughtWorks Finland. I'm a data scientist, but also heading up uh, sustainability and social change for our region. So I'm very interested in alignment issues in systems like this. So I'm curious, you talk about uh, focusing on implicit feedback for your optimization and your evaluation. Um, have you done any research to understand to what degree this reflects actual user preferences in terms of what they want to see recommended and also, do you do any analysis of the impact of these sorts of optimizations on kind of longer term sorts of metrics like retention or future engagement? Thank you. Very good questions. So um, it's it's pretty, it's pretty difficult to say like um, like to an answer this question, right? So uh, whether it reflects customer preferences or, or not, we can only see the overall like metrics like averages, but the uh, ranking quality, diversity and novelty, all these metrics in, improved significantly. And the A-B test showed like business KPIs, corresponding business KPIs went up. And we see like our focus groups within the company. So we see like better ranking for us. So we uh, definitely see that the model works at least on a selected uh, subpopulation. Well, it's, it's a very uh, difficult uh, topic, right? So because there are plenty of ways of interpreting what, what can be uh, a good uh, example of relevant item, what can be not. 
it's uh, and and the ultimate goal of us is to build, of course, a, a, an opportunity for customers to leave like direct feedback whether you like or dislike this item. Do not show me again. But this is like a future story, and the future is shiny because we are also thinking about adding uh, a lot of context, right, to the to the model. So uh, currently, the, the the beauty and the limitation of the current model is that it is it doesn't take any additional features. So the model is pretty self-contained. It, uh, it has all the information baked into the model. That's why you need quite frequent to retrain it and, and deploy. And this saves us from the, infrastructure, from the infrastructural load. So we don't need to uh, maintain like feature stores, whatnot. But in the future, we, we will absolutely need to do that to, to be able to uh, serve like more contextualized models in real time. Yeah, so this is a limitation of the model. It doesn't know, for instance, whether you're at work or at home. So it will uh, it will learn your generic preference is not tied to a specific context. Yeah, and this, this is what we are going to, to solve in the future. Yeah, actually we have many questions online. So maybe we can just take some and then you can ask it after the talk. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna pick some. How to control the degree of diversity and novelty? Yeah, very good, very good question. So um, uh, the 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 diversity is like reflecting uh, the 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 person the per, the personalized the personalization actually. So the more model uh, is personalized, the the more diverse content it show it shows. Uh, like in general, um, so and and uh, but novelty is something that uh, that contradicts a bit the, the personalization. So because you promote something new, it 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 of course it has lower relevancy to the uh, customer that uh, something that is already in his in in, in their history of uh, purchases. So this is a very difficult question. So I don't think uh, anyone has an answer uh, that question. But uh, what we found is like um, uh, putting more aggressive regularization boosts novelty, uh, like and like subsequently lowers the diversity. So we are trying to find a sweet spot of how many, uh, like how many how. How strong should be the regularization to balance between these two uh, extrema? And also, um, novelty um, is kind of uh, like a next level story for the uh, bandit-like algorithms, which could also be implemented on the basis of deep neural networks. And hopefully, maybe in a year, we will make a talk about that. 